Welcome to the Tisas Verona video series podcast and hello everyone from Igor Shebetun, Fabrizio Napoli, David Kabiki, who is going to join us in a bit. Eastern European team. Today we are a pleasure and honor to have Professor Taras Cusio. And Professor Taras Cusio is an associate research fellow at the Henry Jackson Society and professor in the Department of Political Science, National University of Kyiv Mahila Academy. Hello, Professor. Hi. Hi. Uh, today's podcast will be discussing the Ukrainian crisis. It's a super relevant topic and a super hot topic. Also, we're going to touch the geopolitics of Ukraine and, of course, threat of military invasion. Also, uh, at the very beginning, before we proceed with the main questions and uh, we're going to dive into the topic, I would, I think, would be nice to explain to, uh, the, the, to explain the concept of its crisis, to give an opportunity for our spectators to understand actual problematic a little bit deeper. So with the first question, please, Fabrizio. Thank you, Igor, and uh, uh, good morning, Professor. Uh, I want to ask, uh, since uh, uh, it's um, many years that uh, uh, Russia is opposing uh, Ukraine's membership in NATO, uh, why only in 2022 there is uh, such uh, an escalation? Because uh, after the annexation in Crimea, there has been a long-standing status quo. And uh, personally, I didn't uh, see any signal that uh, Ukraine membership was accelerating. So I want to know why uh, we are observing such a crisis only now. Well, it's a good question because I think many people are confused as to why now, you know, what is, what is going on. Um, and I think most Western governments and NATO, EU, understand that this is a completely artificial crisis manufactured by Vladimir Putin. Um, and you can see this in three ways. Uh, you're right that NATO was not about to invite Ukraine into membership. That, that was never even on the cards. Um, secondly, um, the United States was never intending and never planning, never even talked about placing missiles in Ukraine, which could attack Russia. Um, and thirdly, um, Russia's complaints about um, Ukraine's military cooperation with NATO are out of date because Ukraine has been doing this for 30 years. Um, Ukraine began doing this in the mid 1990s when part NATO launched Partnership for Peace. So this is nothing new. Um, under President Kuchma, who was never regarded in Moscow as anti-Russian um, in the kind of mid 2000s or early 2000s, uh, Ukraine was organizing sea breeze and other types of military exercise with NATO in Crimea and elsewhere. So none of these factors uh, changed. So there has to be other reasons. And I think the other reasons are due to a number of factors. And I think these are firstly, um, uh, Ru the Kremlin or Russia uh, had given up on the idea that it could somehow pressurize Ukrainian president this time, uh, Volodymyr Zelensky, into agreeing to Russia's interpretation of the Minsk agreement signed in 2014. There's always been a problem that Ukraine has one set of interpretations, which is what the West believes, and Russia has its own interpretations. Ukraine's always resisted um, accepting the implementation of the Russian version of the Minsk agreements. So I think Russia had given up on that. And your listeners could uh, see this if they look up um, an article by uh, by Dmitry Medvedev, the former president, now deputy head of the Russian Security Council, in early October in Komersant, where he basically said it's a waste of time talking to, to Zelensky. We are now going to talk to his puppet master because the Russian propaganda disinformation uh, image is that Ukraine is a US puppet state. So we're going to talk directly to Washington, forget Zelensky. So that already was sent a signal. And I think another signal was on the 27th of October, Ukraine began using for the first time Turkish drones, which it had purchased. And these, and these drones were um, kind of changed the balance of power in the occupied area, because uh, Russia always tried to use its proxy forces in occupied Donbass to apply pressure on Ukraine to basically agree to implement the Russian version of the Minsk agreements, which in Ukrainian eyes is capitulation. It's 
Um, so when Ukraine used that dr those drones on the 27th of October, the reaction from Russia was very strong, very severe. Um, so I think those are key key moments. Um, a sense that you know uh, the ability uh, of Russia to pressurize Ukraine to um, to to implement the Minsk agreements in the interpretation in Moscow was gone or was slipping away. And therefore we needed to change our approach, our tactics towards Ukraine by issuing these two very strong um, ultimatums. They're, they're not requests by Russia in December, two ultimatums um, in December to the West. And we would back this up with a military buildup on Ukraine's border. So if you don't basically agree with our ultimatums, then we will, as Lavrov and others have said, we will then move to military technical means. Um, now we have to also understand here that these ultimatums are um, kind of very, um, it, it seemed as though for many people when they read these ultimatums that Russia never had any intention of having them accepted in the West because they had incredibly ridiculous demands like for example, that countries that joined NATO after 1997, like Poland or the Baltic States, Romania, should remove NATO um, bases or NATO military equipment, and, and everything should return to what it was in, in, 2000, in 1997. That's never going to happen, of course, um, never. And, 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 I, and, and, you, and when you see other um, documents from Moscow, like there was just a few weeks ago, Russia sent an officially written reply to American, America's reply to these guarantees. Russia also made a whole bunch of um, um, statements that simply have no basis in fact. For example, that um, in when Crimea <clears throat> was annexed in 2014, there was no military intervention from Russia. Of course, this is a complete lie. Secondly, there are no Russian forces inside Ukraine, inside the Donbass. Again, nobody in the West believes this. I mean, you cannot create um, a Donbass separatist or proxy army of 35,000 strong without external support. That's simply impossible. Um, so um, I always believe, therefore, from the very beginning of this crisis in November, that negotiation was going to fail. Um, because I just didn't see where there would be this kind of golden center compromise between both sides. Um, and um, the, I think the reasons for that are kind of many, but we are, I don't think the West or many people in the West until now understand who they're dealing with in Moscow. Putin um, um, you brings together three characteristics, three personalities. He's a former KGB officer, so therefore he sees conspiracies everywhere. So he really does believe that the Orange Revolution, Euromaidan Revolution, Rose Revolution in Georgia were CIA or EU you know, conspiracies against Russia. And, and secondly, he really does believe that Ukraine is a puppet state of the West. I mean, he, he believes that you know, these are really little Russians in Ukraine who, are, who really want to live with Russia, but they are prevented from doing so by American control um, of Ukraine through its fascist leaders who took power in 2014. Of course, this is all fantasy world. I mean, Ukraine is led by a Jewish Ukrainian Russian speaker from Eastern Ukraine. How can you have a fascist Ukraine if it's led by a Jewish Ukrainian guy? Uh, um, how, 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 tell me how, it's pretty, impossible. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I think that um, where sometimes in the West, and this relates to your question as well, that, um, that we are thinking about NATO as an issue for Ukraine, NATO is not the central problem in this. Um, because as we said, as I said as well, that uh, Ukraine was not about to be invited to NATO. The central crux of this entire crisis is that uh, firstly, Russia since the 1990s, since Yeltsin era, it, since the mid 1990s, has demanded that Eurasia, the former Soviet Union, 
excluding the Baltic states. So the former Soviet Union, Eurasia, should be Russia's exclusive sphere of influence. That means no NATO, no EU, no UN peacekeepers. Russia dominates. This is related to Russia not um, kind of never really understanding what its borders are, you know, because Russia is the inheritor of the Soviet Union and Russian and Soviet identity were, were basically the same. So Russian identity is, has always been bigger than the Russian Republic in the Soviet Union and now it's bigger. Russian identity sees Russia in inverted commas as Eurasia. And secondly, um, uh, under Putin in the last 20 years, what you've had is a degradation, a stagnation of Russian nationalism to pre-Soviet times. So now Ukrainians don't exist in Moscow. There are no Ukrainians. There's no Ukraine. This is little Russia and these are little Russians. Now we have the Tsarist view in Moscow that the three Eastern Slavs, Russians, Ukrainians, Belarusians are branches of a pan-Russian nation. Obshe narod in Russian. Um, this is a, a worse approach than even in the Soviet Union, because in the Soviet Union, yes, there were, you know, Russification and this, that, and other, but the Soviet regime recognized Ukrainians as a separate people. It recognized Ukrainian as a separate language. In fact, in 1945, Joseph Stalin negotiated three seats at the United Nations. Soviet Union, which was Russia's, Ukraine and Belarus. So Ukraine was a founding member of the United Nations in 1945. So it's been a kind of a, a sovereign state, if you want to call it that, for, for a long time. But that's no longer the view in Moscow. So the view in Moscow is Ukraine is Russian. And therefore, um, Ukraine should be part of Russia, should be part of the Russian world, shall we say, like Belarus. So the, the, um, the kind of um, example that Ukraine should follow should be Belarus. Ukraine should be Belarus too. Um, and the leader in charge of Ukraine should be somebody like Lukashenko. That is normality for in Moscow. What is now the case in Ukraine is not normality and therefore they need to change this. They need to do something. Um, and hence why Western governments and intelligence agencies have been talking about Russia's goal of regime change. Now, you know, whether this is feasible is a separate question, but um, because Ukraine, even in the Soviet Union was never like Belarus, never. Um, it was just ne never as Russified, it was never as, as placid, you know, in the Soviet Union, Belarus was more similar to Central Asia than to the kind of European Soviet Union. I mean, they had very few dissidents um, and it was a very Russified country. So, so Lukashenko is kind of very typical. Um, in some ways, you know, Belarus is a bit like a, 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 a Bolshoi Donbass, a big Donbass. <laughs> um, and and as, as, as the, as the as the president of Ukraine from Donbass, Viktor Yanukovych found out, Ukraine is not Donbass. Ukraine will never be Donbass. So, but you know, Russia will continue to try to uh, change Ukraine into this second Belarus because that's the way it sees Ukraine. Ukraine is Russian. It's part of the Russian world. And the way Russia sees it is that the three Eastern Slavs in the Russian world are the core, the center ground the central core of his or Putin's Eurasian economic union. And just like in the Soviet Union, the three Eastern Slavs were the core, the central part of the Soviet Union. Um, when the Soviet Union was disintegrated in, um, in early December 1991, it was the three Eastern Slavs we, who disintegrated it. They didn't ask the Georgians or Uzbeks, the three Eastern Slavs got together. They got very drunk, by the way. Um, um, with Boris Yeltsin, um, typically, and they uh, got rid of the Soviet Union. And then they told the Central Asians and they told the South Caucasians. So Putin sees the same thing. So Ukraine is the missing link from this equation. It's the missing link from this Russian world. You can't have the Russian world, which is like a kind of a 21st century Kiev Rus, without Kiev, without Ukraine. Um, and so for, the, for Putin, he is obsessed, and I don't exaggerate here, he's obsessed with 
Ukraine and is obsessed with getting Ukraine back. So hence, this is the crisis. You know, until maybe autumn of last year, the R Moscow believed they could get Ukraine back in other ways, you know, forced diplomacy with the help of the French and Germans in the Minsk agreement process. That, that then they realized wasn't going to work. So now they move to something else. And hence, we have this crisis today. Yeah, in terms, uh, you mentioned they're going to continue. I mean, Russia is going to continue influence on Ukraine. So uh, we can predict, we can uh, just assume a few scenarios. So the next question about potential scenario of developing the Ukrainian crisis. Uh, I'm a bit in the military, so I can for sure see that uh, this those amount of military troops on borders, it's not enough to invade Ukraine. So it is like partially, yeah, it could be potentially, but again, a few regions, mostly, maybe three, four, but not completely, at least the half of Ukraine. So full invasion or will it be full invasion or will it be as a hybrid war uh, with the entering regular army under explanation of humanitarian mission or helping out like to make peace on this territory? unoccupied territories and then some sort of like arranging of provocation with a lot of let's say victims among Russian soldiers and that's going to be the reason to respond and capture at least like to go further on a few regions further or just flexing the muscles and actually gathering some points on international stage. Um, I don't think that um, you know there are two possible extremes. Um, one is that Putin just says, okay, I've, I've tried everything I tried and I go home and, and we end all of this, right? And the other extreme is um, a full, full scale invasion. But between those two extremes, there's plenty of different options um, and even combinations of options. I agree with you that until about a week ago, I was very, uh, not very, um, I did not really believe that um, Russia would have a, would be able to do a full-scale invasion because they weren't enough troops. I mean, now we hear different numbers, you know, anything up to 180, 190, including in Belarus. Um, but still, that would be difficult um, because I don't think um, many Western journalists know, know Ukraine, who are even in Ukraine. Ukraine is huge in terms of territory. Um, and also it has, I mean, this is not a small country in terms of army. It has the third largest army in Europe. Plus on top of the army, you have, you know, security forces, National Guard, police, um, the security service. And then you have up to a million reservists. Um, 400,000 of which in those reservists are veterans of the war. You know, the biggest experts on fighting Russian hybrid warfare are in Ukraine. They've been doing it for eight years. Um, so um, I think I got I got very frustrated with Western um, so-called experts um, who are experts on Russia, but then they became experts on Ukraine, um, saying, "Oh, this is going to be over in two days. You know, Ukraine will be captured in two days." They really don't understand urban warfare, um, and they don't understand um, the difficulties in fighting such a big army and big country. Now, Russia's advantage is in the air. Ukraine does have surface to air potential, you know, missiles and, and, and stingers and everything else, but Russia has a bigger air force and that. Um, the Western um, um, writing has claimed or, or, or alluded to the fact that Russia will use things like missiles and, and, and other potential military means to destroy buildings in Kiev, which, you know, the government, parliament, president's office, I mean, I, for me, I find this unbelievable. I mean, is it really possible in the 21st century that a country would do this unprovoked against a neighboring country? That's, it seems like, are you sure we're living in the 21st century? This seems like crazy. Um, so I am still not fully in belief of that. I think that, I mean, it's difficult to understand the Russian um, kind of uh, approach, but I think that they want to um, do this kind of salami tactics of applying continuous pressure, um, particularly on degrading Ukraine's economic situation, degrading, you know, Western financial uh, investment and this kind of thing, and to maybe bring up a crisis in the economy and 
and, and helped to organize uh, political protests against Zelensky. Um, they want to apply such levels of uh, pressure against Zelensky that he basically agrees to, cap to capitulate, to agree to Russia's demands, which are the two, the two main demands are, yes, to negate NATO membership and to agree to Russian interpretation of the Minsk agreements. And in the first case, the NATO um, membership question, that might be possible, but very difficult because it's in the Ukrainian constitution. So that requires a vote in the Ukrainian parliament passed by two thirds of members of parliament. That would be difficult for Zelensky to do. And secondly, Russia's interpretation of the Minsk agreements, every Ukrainian understands, every Ukrainian expert and politician understands that in implementing the Russian interpretation of the Minsk agreement means Bosnian, Bosnianization of Ukraine and Finlandization of Ukraine. What do I mean by that? Bosnianization means that Russia wants the creation of a kind of a Belarus too, yes, but a very weak state with a weak central government, a kind of a, a heavily federalized state where these Russian um, entities in the Donbass, these Russian proxy states, have uh, veto powers over domestic and foreign policies in Kiev. I mean, this would be the weirdest federal state in history. Um, and, um, and secondly, um, Finlandization, but not like Finland and Austria in the Cold War. This would be whereby um, Russia would have kind of, you know, Ukraine would, yes, negate, say no to EU and NATO membership, but would, but would be part of the Russian sphere of influence. I think where in the West they don't, uh, th there isn't an understanding of, of these questions is that they think that if Ukraine says no to NATO tomorrow, that everything's okay, everything, the crisis ends. This is not true. We have to remember 2014. Between 2010 and 2014, Ukraine was a neutral country under Yanukovych, under the president. Ukraine had what was called then a non-bloc status foreign policy, which is basically neutrality. That did not stop Russia invading in 2014. <laughs> um, and secondly, um, Russia does not, um, does not, would not just accept as a status quo, Ukraine saying no to NATO. What Russia wants is Ukraine to come back home in Russia's eyes. So like in, two, in between 2012 when Putin became president again and 2014 during the Euromaidan revolution, um, uh, Yanukovych was under in, intense pressure from Putin and from the Kremlin to say no to signing the association agreement with the European Union. So uh, in Moscow, they, don't, they do not just not want Ukraine to join NATO. They do not want Ukraine to even cooperate with the EU because, they, because you can, no country can be a member of two customs unions. You cannot be a member of the Eurasian Customs Union and the EU Customs Union. You can only be a member of one. So what, what Russia wants is that Ukraine says no to the EU Customs Union, no to the association agreement with the EU, and yes to the Eurasian one. So if Ukraine uh, went down the road of saying no to EU and NATO, there will be intense pressure by Moscow, like in 2012, 2014, to join the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, and I think these are the goals that Russia wants. So I think they will do uh, salami tactics. They will, um, I think, certainly pressure in the Donbass, which has already begun with um, false flag operations and potentially high, higher military conflict there, maybe an attempt to expand Russian control of the Donbass, which is 40% to all of the Donbass. But also a dangerous area is the coastline, the, the Black Sea coastline. Um, um, sort of west of Crimea towards Odessa, because that would be a good way to apply economic pressure on Ukraine. Um, if Ukraine cannot export goods and import goods, then that would be big, a big, big negative influence on the economy. Where I find it difficult, like yourself, to appreciate the full invasion is, you know, the idea that Russia would try to capture Kiev. That I find this is what you know, even Americans are saying. Um, you know, Secretary of State Blinken said this today and yesterday that uh, Russia is aiming to, to capture Kiev. But that would be incredibly difficult. 
uh, for all sorts of reasons. Firstly, it's 4 million people. And counterinsurgency, the, you know, doctrine says that needs a lot of troops because you are literally fighting for every building. Um, and throughout Kiev, there are already arms, arms bases, you know, ready in buildings and anti-tank weapons ready. So this would be a bloodbath for Russia. I mean, unless they're willing to do like in Grozny, where they destroyed and flattened the city. And then that, then we are on a different level. So that to me sounds difficult to believe, but this is the dilemma Putin has. Putin has this big dilemma that on the one hand, if he just does a small invasion, Donbass or Odessa, he doesn't get regime change. So he still gets the same stubborn Ukrainians in Kiev who say, no, we are not capitulating, we are not agreeing to your demands, right? So Putin's dilemma is that unless he does a full-scale invasion, unless he tries to do regime change, then he cannot get what he wants from Ukraine. Ukraine cannot become Belarus too unless he changes Kiev. And, and, and that's where I think many people are wondering, is he really that crazy to, do, to try this? Um, because then you are really moving into dangerous territory. Um, and, you know, then we have the biggest crisis in Europe since the Cuban Missile Crisis in 1961. Uh, with the next question, David Kabiki, please. Yes, thank you. I would like um, to, to ask a question on the long run. It seems to me that um, in, oh, in the past, <laughs> medium long run, it seems to me that the um, so move towards the West has, be, has gained more and more prominence in Ukrainian discourses, social and political. We can thank Vladimir Putin. Yeah, but at the same time, we have different uh, positions from Russia and the EU. So what would be the most likely, let's say, scenario and the one that would make everyone happy? Would perhaps a united Ukraine that would serve as a buffer zone? Or would perhaps a divided Ukraine between West and East, one able to join the EU or NATO in the long run, and the other one moving towards Russia, or even becoming part of Russia, perhaps? Well, I, I think I think your, your question is a bit out of date in the sense of the last eight years. And I'll tell you, I'll explain why. Because that, um, that concept of a divided Ukraine between a pro-Russian East and pro-Western pro um, West of Ukraine, um, sort of down that split down the river in the middle, um, is gone. It ended in 2014. Um, uh, myself and two of the colleagues just finished, um, just published a book um, about Nip the region of Dnipropetrovsk, which borders Donbass region in, in eastern Ukraine, about the changes in, in identity in that region since, since 2014. Uh, there is no such thing as East Ukraine anymore. Eastern Ukrainian identity in the sense of what you're talking about being pro-Russian, kind of pro-Russian world, pro-Eurasian, anti-Europe, um, now used to be eight regions of, of southern Eastern Ukraine, which were Russian speaking, and now it's only the two regions of the Donbass. Those are the only two regions left. Um, and you see this in electoral voting. So um, pro-Russian parties now can never win parliamentary or presidential elections again. Whereas prior to 2014, always in a presidential election in the second round, you had a pro-Russian candidate and a pro-Western candidate. That's no longer going to be happening. So today, uh, pro-Russian parties um, are usually in about fourth or fifth place in opinion polls with about eight, 10%. And pro-Russian um, presidential candidates have maybe five, six, 7%. Um, when the British intelligence released um, some information a few, a few weeks ago about Moscow's favorite candidate to become leader of this kind of, you know, Belarus 2 version of Ukraine is somebody called Yevgeny or Yevhen Muraev. In the opinion polls, he has, his party has 5%. Um, he himself has 7% as a candidate. These are all marginal. Um, the um, so pro-Russian pro-Russianism, shall we say, is dead in Ukraine, and I don't. Obviously, some people in the West don't realize this. Um, 
but in particular in Moscow, they don't realize it because in Moscow, they simply do not understand Ukraine for one reason. For one, one reason. I, I very rarely meet, I mean, very rarely um, meet Russian academics, think tankers, Russian politicians who, who understand Ukraine. They simply don't get it because they see Ukraine through their own stereotypes. And secondly, um, uh, nobody in Moscow understands the concept of Russian speaking Ukrainian patriotism. Nobody. Um, and yet this exists. It, 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 it showed itself to exist in 2014. Putin's new Russia project, so-called, for um, southern eastern Ukraine in 2014 completely failed. Completely. Um, and um, it was successful to some degree in the Donbass, but only because Russia invaded twice in August 2014 and January 2015. Because if Russia had not invaded, those pro-Russian forces would have been defeated by Ukrainian army, which in 2014 was very weak compared to now. Um, so um, I don't think they understand this, this uh, that, you know, that most Ukrainians living in so-called Russian-speaking Ukraine are patriots of Ukraine. They have a civic uh, Russian-speaking identity. They don't have antagonism to the Ukraine language. And that this conflict, this war, um, is not a, a war between Russian and Ukrainian speakers. It's a war between um, one group of people majority of Ukrainians who see themselves as Ukrainian in their identity, and another group of people who see themselves as members of the Russian world, part of the Russian world. So they actually do believe that to some degree they are little Russians. They, they see them, they see that the Ukraine as part of that Russian world, part of Eurasia, and they're very hostile to Europe. And, and that's the way you understand I mean, for example, when I've been to the front line of the war, you can see people from Donbass fighting for Ukraine. And when you talk to them, that's how they explain it. Um, one side is has a Ukraine identity, even though they can be Russian speaking, and the other side has an identity, which is the one promoted by Moscow, that you are all part of the Russian world. You are Ruski. Um, you are little Russians. You are part of Eurasia. Um, and, and that's how the, the, the inhabitants split. But in the rest of Ukraine, in, in that southern eastern Ukraine, um, the identity is Ukrainian. I mean, it, this identity was, was, you know, your attachment to Ukraine was, was um, expanded and deepened during Soviet rule because Ukraine was, it wasn't an independent state, but it was a, you know, it has its own uh, institutions within the Soviet system. And so people developed an identity to Soviet Ukraine, to that territory. Um, and many Ukrainians, even in that Russian speaking area, you know, they, they understand Ukrainian, they speak Ukrainian, they have links to Ukrainian speaking villages. So they're not hostile to Ukrainian. So I think that that East West split is, is, is gone and Russia will will find, will be surprised when it invades, because I think when you read Russian nationalists, um, they believe that when they invade Ukraine, they will be met by people standing on the street with bread and salt, and they will not. By the way, the region of Ukraine with the highest number of deaths of soldiers in this war is Dnipropetrovsk, not West Ukraine. So, the people who have suffered the most from this war are East Ukrainian Russian speakers, um, both from deaths, from civilian deaths, military deaths, and also from the two million refugees from, from the Donbass. Um, I mean, the, the Donbass was about five million. Now there's three million in the Donbass, two million left to go to the rest of Ukraine. So um, it, Russia could try to, do, to split the country, but um, I think that would be very difficult. And you can see this, by the way, in Zelensky. Zelensky is from, from Dnipropetrovsk. He's a Jewish Ukrainian Russian speaker from Dnipropetrovsk, and yet he's a Ukrainian patriot. So I, I don't think that Russia may try this, of course, to divide the country in half. Um, but 
I think it won't be very successful. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm very doubtful of this. And, um, and they will be very surprised at the reaction of local people in that region. The problem is that they haven't learned their lessons from 2014. When the, the new Russia project failed in 2014, they haven't learned their lessons. And the reason they haven't learned their lessons is because dictators like Putin are never told the truth by their advisors. They're, they surround themselves by sycophants telling him the same things that he believes in. Nobody's you know, tapping Putin on his shoulder and saying, Vladimir, I think, I think we messed up. I think we really screwed up in 2014. Maybe we need to change our policies. No, nobody's just saying that to him. So they, they never learn their lessons about their failures in Ukraine. And, and therefore, they have continued in the last eight years to make things worse. Um, the um, Ukraine until 2014 was not anti-Russian. Today it's anti-Russian because of Vladimir Putin. I really appreciate my colleagues uh, to touch significant points. And uh, uh, David Gabiki touched really interesting points. To have a look, he gave us a chance to have a look in the future. What going to be the reaction? What the potential scenario of it? Also, uh, Fabrizio, really appreciate you that you touched significant points as well. That's uh, what's the behind the curtains? Why that happens? Yeah. And uh, it was really pleasant to have you, Professor, in our podcast and Thank to you. hear your points. Thank you for uh, which really gave us uh, an opportunity, an overview, and actually uh, of the overview of the peculiarity of the crisis and understanding the role of the Ukraine in security, not just in Ukraine region, but uh, for whole Europe as well, because it's a huge part of Europe. And really appreciate you. Many thanks and hope to see you again in ITSS Verona. I'm sure that uh, Vladimir Putin, who is president for life, and because he's obsessed with Ukraine, that we will return to this subject. Yeah, let's cross fingers for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay, bye-bye. Thank you very bye -bye. much. Thank you.